Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome from Exeter and Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Laura Tolchin, and I'm here today with Cody Gerfein, and we are the co-founders and co-chairs of Exeter's Women's Initiative Network, Exeter Wins, our employee resource group designed to attract, retain, and promote premier female leadership at Exeter and throughout the industry. I'm also an MBA candidate at Columbia Business School, so today is an especially exciting event for me. We're thrilled you could join us today for our virtual event, Inclusive, Effective, and Fearless Teams, Navigating Through Inflection Points with Rita McGrath. Rita will be talking to us about how to connect the strategic imperative of taking confident, agile action with the importance of creating psychologically safe environments. This is a really relevant topic for Exeter and our WINS group. For those of you who don't know Exeter, we're the global authority on financial crime and fraud, revolutionizing the way banks, corporations, and governance manage risk through our combination of practical expertise, award-winning technology, and process excellence. Exeter is committed to creating a more sustainable compliance environment with a holistic and innovative approach to problem solving. We operate out of 11 offices with more than 650 employees around the world, many of whom are on the line today. Our mission at Exeter is to make the world a safer place to do business, and we know how important teamwork and psychological safety is to good business practices. Before we introduce Rita, I did want to just go over a few logistics. A recording of this event will be made available as a playback in case you're interested in revisiting any content. You're also welcome to tweet throughout using hashtag Columbia Exec Ed or hashtag Exeter Wins. And don't forget to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box below. We will be collecting the questions throughout the event for a Q&A session at the end. Thanks, Laura. And hi, I'm Cody Gerfein from Exeter. We're honored to hear from, and it's my pleasure to introduce Rita McGrath, a best-selling author, sought-after advisor and speaker, and longtime faculty member at Columbia Business School. Rita is one of the world's foremost experts on strategy and innovation, and is consistently ranked among the top 10 management thinkers in the world, including the number one award for strategy by Thinkers 50. Her recent book on strategic inflection points is Seeing Around Corners, How to Spot Inflection Points in Business Before They Happen. Rita is the author of four other books, including the best-selling The End of Competitive Advantage. At Columbia Business School Executive Education, Rita is the faculty director of Strategy in Uncertain Times and the Women in Leadership Program, both with upcoming sessions running this spring in April and May. So stay tuned for more information about her programs at the end of the event. And with that, thank you again for joining us, Rita. I'll turn it over to you, and then Laura and I will be back again for Q&A. Oh, what a pleasure. Well, thanks so much, Cody and Laura, and uh, it's always great to support our students. Welcome, everybody, to our virtual world. And what I'd like to talk about is two things. One is strategy and how that has shifted, um, and then how we need to structure organizations that are able to function in these high uncertainty uh, spaces. And the question of teamwork is actually one I've been working on for a long time under the umbrella of my longstanding interest in strategy. And I thought just to set things in context, it would be interesting to think about what strategy really is today. And when I first started in the field, you know, longer ago than I care to remember, uh, there was this overriding idea that the goal of strategy was to find an attractive position in an attractive industry and throw up entry barriers like crazy. And then you got to giggle to yourself for years with what was called a sustainable competitive advantage. And what we're learning, and certainly the pandemic has accelerated this learning, is that that model may work in a few places. You know, if you've got the ability to really create pseudo monopoly conditions or you really do have entry barriers. But what we're finding is that in more and more parts of our economy, what we're dealing with instead is shorter or transient competitive advantages. And this slide from the gaming business brings that to life in my view, which is, you know, in the beginning you had arcade games 
And that's all there was. <laughs> you know, you had to go to a physical place during working hours and throw money into this refrigerator-sized machine. And uh, and you know, it was it was analog. So the machine and the game, we've forgotten that this even existed. The machine and the game were the same. So these machines were incredibly expensive. And there were only about, I don't know, 42 games in the whole world because it was so hard to program them. Well, the next big transition was the shift towards separating out the intelligence of the game from the machine on which it was played. And so that opened up, you know, at home games, which was awesome, right? You had games in little bitty form factors so you could take them with you. That had never been thought about before. Then we had all kinds of different form factors on which the software came. So you had games on cassette tape. You don't have to admit it, but some of you will remember those. Then we had games on CDs. Now, of course, we've got games in the cloud, games on phones, games in, you know, virtual reality, 3D reality. Um, and my point here is that if you were thinking of building a sustainable competitive advantage in the arcade game business, uh, you'd be a pretty disappointed person by now because the whole uh, situation has moved on. And so the first observation I would make about strategy is that we need to be more open to the idea that things can't stay the same and they don't. And that means that as leaders, we need to be really good at all the different life cycle phases of an advantage. So the innovation transformation process where new advantages come from, the exploitation process where you get to enjoy having built something that you've created and be justifiably proud of it, and the erosion phase where we've got to learn to let go and say farewell to things that may have served us very, very well in the past, but they're not going to represent uh, our future. And that's hard. That's really hard. And the reason it's hard, in my view, is that most leaders in organizations today have been taught very, very well how to operate, you know, how to do that piece where you've got the advantage in place, the industry exists, your transactions exist. There's a lot of knowledge about what is necessary to achieve success. We haven't been trained in the methodologies around innovation because if you think about it, when the world moves more slowly, you don't need innovations every day. You need innovations, you know, what, once a decade. And so most of us don't spend much of our careers in the innovation space or transformation space. And the erosion space, again, if you've got long lasting competitive advantages, things do erode and they do get shifted as the gaming example suggests, but it's not something all of us have to deal with on a regular basis. And I think that creates an interesting challenge for leaders in established organizations, which is how do you get smarter about each phase of this? And so when it comes to strategy, I talk a lot about the new strategy playbook, and we'll make the connection to teamwork in just a minute. But we're going from a world where we assume the normal thing is stability, and the weird thing is change, right? Which means we need to be more agile. We're going from a world where we kind of avoid the idea of disengagement, which means shutting something down or shrinking it as the market around it changes. We tend to be kind of uncomfortable about that. It's like, we just shove that under the rug. We don't really want to talk about it. I'd say in the future, we need to get better at what I call healthy disengagement, being able to stop things that were wonderful perhaps once, but didn't really um, carry us into the future. Resource allocation is one of the critical processes we're going to have to get a lot smarter about because what we're dealing with in companies is this disconnect, right? Strategy, which when it's done right, is pulling you into the future. Budgeting, which is often dragging you into the past. Project approval, which is often run by a bunch of people who have nothing to do with either strategy or budgets. And finally, the incentive system. And what I find a lot is people in organizations are getting rewarded for the thing that happened five strategies ago, you know, and, oh, we haven't had time to get around to the comp system. We'll just leave it the way it is. So you've got your rewards, which are telling you to go here, and your strategy, which is begging you to go there, and the two don't come together. So this control over the alignment between resources and the rest of your organizational processes is absolutely key. Innovation, uh, you know, I think we need to go from a world where innovation is this weird thing that creative people come into the middle of the night and do to something that's much more of a proficiency. So that means you need ideation, getting great ideas, of course, but you need incubation, that piece in the middle where things really fall apart in most large organizations. And then finally, acceleration, where whatever it was you dreamed up in the venturing process now needs to mature and be brought to become part of the parent. And each of those processes, the encouragement I would offer you, each of those processes has a methodology to it, which a lot of people are just not familiar with. 
Then we have new requirements for leadership. And increasingly what we're seeing is we're going from this model of leaders knowing everything and telling people what to do to a model where leaders are much more discovery driven. They're waiting for the edges of the organization to suggest to them what the right course of action needs to be. And this is where this concept of psychologically safe teams is absolutely critical. And then finally, we have careers. And what you'll find is that increasingly many people are in what I would call a tour of duty career environment. So you turn up for an assignment, you might execute against that really well. And then the assignment comes to an end and you may decide to re-up as in re-sign up for another tour of duty, or you may decide, you know, this is a time to make a transition. We might leave. And a new phenomenon I'm seeing, even in large organizations, is we've we changed our sense of what loyalty is, right? And loyalty is much more on this particular career tour of duty, I'm going to give my all to. But that may be not be right for me in three years, four years, it may be something I'm going to change. And what we're seeing now is people are leaving organizations, coming back to the same organization, leaving again, that used to be unheard of, you know, you'd you left, you put your stuff in a cardboard box and please leave and we're never going to you know, see you again. That's totally changed. We're realizing now that people have different skill sets. And if your skill set is around the innovation and growth process, maybe you're not necessary full time. Maybe you, you, you know, go to a place where that skill set is needed and then come back. So what I would argue, and this is really the subject of my most recent book, is that certainly now we're in the midst of these strategic inflection points. And I define a strategic inflection point as something that exerts a 10x force upon whatever your business used to be. So, you know, any business grows up at a certain point in time where some things are possible and some things are not. And what an inflection point does is it changes that realm of possibility. So it removes a constraint or it imposes new ones, or it makes something 10x cheaper or 10x faster or 10x more convenient. Now, here's the thing. If you're thinking about your world in the old way, you know, with the constraints that were there at the time, it's really hard to see how these things are changing. So let's just take YouTube as a case in point. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that between YouTube and Facebook and Amazon Web Services, the whole cost of digital communication has decreased by orders and orders of magnitude. And um, what does that do to established industries? Well, if you think about it, 20 years ago, if I wanted to get a video message to 100 million people, you know, I had to be News Corp or Metro Goldwyn Mayer or something, even 20 years ago. Um, because how did we get on the internet 20 years ago? We dialed in, right? Remember the old modem thing? Um, and, and so you couldn't have high, high definition, high quality, immediate transmission of video content. It just didn't exist. Enter YouTube, enter some of these other new technologies, and literally teenagers in a garage someplace can communicate to hundreds of millions of people. The order of magnitude shift in what it's taken to get these communication channels working is, is just dramatic. In fact, there was a piece just this weekend in Bloomberg Business Week about a boy, I think he's nine, and he's an Instagram influencer and a YouTube influencer. He's got millions of people following him, and he's now got a, a toy brand. Uh, so he's selling actual merchandise. So in effect, he's competing with Toys R Us, right? Um, but this is all done in a super cheap way out of his garage, basically. And he's been doing it since he was three years old with the support of his parents. I mean, the ability of, of people to break through now is, is just astonishing. And so the lock that established organizations have on reality is really shifting. And the fact that you've got lots of money and big assets doesn't really protect you against that sort of context. So of course, right now, just to put us in context of where we are, you know, we're dealing with maybe four major inflection points. We've got certainly the pandemic and what comes next. We've got uh, an economic crisis uh, across the world. We've got a justice crisis where people are saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, there are real inequities uh, in the world. And, uh, and then we've got a climate crisis where you know, it's pretty clear that, that anybody who's paying attention, things in the natural environment are changing. And talk about the mother of all inflection points, that's, that's pretty big. So I think it's important to be thinking about how you and your organization are going to navigate this, because this is unprecedented. You know, 30 years ago is not going to be like what 30 years from now are. So now let's transition to what it takes inside the organization to cope with environments like that. 
And this is where I really want to connect the agenda around human potential, human genius, human joy and emotion to, you know, the, the hardcore strategy tasks that all of us need to get done. And the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, organizations that can bring in diverse talent. And of course, there's the who you are diversity, you know, what race you are, what gender, what religion. But there's also the lived experience diversity. Where have you been in the world? What have you been exposed to? And do you know about different things that perhaps others don't? Um, so I think you really need to look at those two dimensions of diversity. I think too often we get really one dimension about it. And there's just a mountain of evidence that in an environment, and this is the key point, in an environment where you can't repeat a past solution, where what's required are novel and creative solutions to new problems that we've never seen before. And I would say there's not a person who's part of this presentation that is not in that position because we are dealing with four inflection points that are going to fundamentally change the rules. We just don't know how yet. So how are you gonna come up with the creative response when the tried and true playbook is hardly likely to work? And I think that's really the, the core, core message I wanna to give to you, which is if you want creative solutions, you have to foster human creativity. And if you wanna foster human creativity, this idea of including uh, ideas from many different sources, from many diverse sources is not, uh, is not an optional. It's, it's really going to determine winners and losers. So when you come to things like loyalty, innovation, performance, customer insights, uh, diverse organizations just do better. And this is Russell Reynolds. They put their reputation on the line by doing some of this uh, work. So the core, I think, of inclusivity really goes back to some work that was done by my brilliant colleague, Amy Edmonds. And we're both of a similar generation in academia. She did more organizational and teams-based stuff and I was doing more strategy. And the two of us have often remarked that she was busy doing teams and then discovered without an effective strategy, ugh, teams really struggled. And I was busy doing strategy and you know, eventually you run into the people, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden you've got, what do you mean I need to know something about teams? Can't we all just be little robots executing our strategy? Uh, and so over the years, we've come to really appreciate the deep interconnections and overlap um, between our work. And what Amy found, and the finding was a bit of a surprise, which was she was studying errors in hospitals and had very, it was a very well-designed study, independent groups that rated the quality of a team uh, and then rated the, and then captured data on the number of errors that teams were making. And they came up with an anomaly, which was teams that one group of independent raters said were better teams, more equally functioning, you know, better information exchanges and so forth, were reporting more medical errors. And this got Amy thinking. And eventually she came to the conclusion it wasn't the case that there were more medical errors. It was the case that these teams felt more comfortable raising them, talking about them, and coming to some conclusions about what to do next. And what we've seen in high reliability organizations where you've got very complex systems. This is absolutely critical. So just take air traffic, right? In, in the air system, the system of airplane flying, this technique has been extended into actual operating requirements. If there's an error, you're not just invited to talk about it, you're required to talk about it. And it is a, a big reason why air travel has become so safe. It's because all those things that are sort of hidden uh, when people aren't performing well are now um, really uh, important and, and raised. So um, I think psychological safety, absolutely key. What it means is that the, it's the shared belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. And I think that's a key, key issue that we need to um, uh, deal with. So um, the where I would now like to take you is what does that mean for us? How do we get started? So let's say this is a new concept or it's a concept you kind of heard about but want to get into more. Um, I think a way of thinking about it is if you think of the situation on the right, right, where we're comfortable admitting mistakes, we can afford to um, you know, say, oh, that didn't work so well, did it? But it's in a way that's safe. You, know, you don't feel, oh, should I raise that question or I don't want to look stupid or whatever. What you have is more collective wisdom. So more people sharing the, their ideas, more people being willing to contribute ideas. And by the way, we know ideas are a cumulative process, right? No idea ever emerges in fully featured future form <laughs> when you first come up with it. It's, they're ugly and they've got to be bad. They're, they're incomplete. They, they need other people's wisdom to bring them into life. And so when you have psychological safety, you've got this virtuous circle almost of people being willing to share ideas. The quality of the ideas is better. Uh, the, the, 
the ability to bounce each bounce ideas off each other is better versus an environment where people are afraid. Uh, there's blame going on. They're less likely to share their views. There's what's called the common knowledge effect, which means we have very little knowledge that everybody shares. And we have much more rich individual knowledge, which isn't getting into the conversation. And again, you now you have a negative cycle because we're not we're not getting the best ideas out. We're not uh, creatively problem solving. And I can say this to you and that's great. And But when I look at um, the way a lot of organizations operate, um, just to take something that's in the headlines today, the, the whole conversation about, do we need a union you know, at places like Amazon and, and the, the, the putting people on meters so that they feel that every motion has to be accounted for. Uh, you know, basically people as badly performing robots, um, you know, you're not going to get the best out of people in a context like that. So I'll be interested to see how that all works out. But it's a very live conversation. So where do you start? Um, and I'll start with the premise from the book, which is when you're trying to understand how a big change is going to affect your organization, you can't go to the conference table in headquarters to find that answer. <laughs> you have to go out to what I call the edges. And in the language Andy Grove, who came up with this whole idea of strategic inflection points used, he said, you know, if you want to know where spring is making itself felt, you must go to the periphery because that's where the snow is most exposed. And the way I would talk about that is snow melts, but it melts from the edges. So how do you create this psychologically safe environment where you can get out to the edges, learn what's going on, and bring that information into some kind of conversation, which allows you to mount these creative responses? So the first premise is, as a leader, what you want to be doing is setting the stage and the expectations. Some people call this setting the table. And one of my heroes in this regard is a guy named Alan Mulally. Uh, he turned around Ford. I mean, this was a $17 billion disaster about to happen. Um, and uh, within a year, he had them basically making money. They didn't need a bailout in 2008 when all the other car companies were imploding around them. But what Alan will tell you is the core, core, core of this turnaround was something he called one team and the working together approach. And he said, everybody has to be included. Everybody has ideas. And he is ruthless about it. I mean, if you think about that juxtaposition, it's very, very interesting. So a great story about Alan is um, everybody is required once a week to come into this thing he calls a business process review meeting. And it's literally your week. How did you do this week? And everybody's got their performance. Um, this is the leadership team. Everybody's got their performance for the week uh, on a PowerPoint of all things. And it's color coded. So green is good, we're on track, we did what we said we would do. Yellow is, yeah, we've got some problems, we're not quite sure how to deal with it. Red is, ooh, I've got a problem and uh, I don't know how to cope with it. Well, when he first came into Ford, whatever the opposite of a psychologically safe organization is, he had it because they were all competing with each other to be the next promotion, to get the next job. And the enemy was not General Motors, it was the guy down the hall who could compete with you for the next hierarchical level. Um, and so people hid information, people didn't share. Anybody who did share was seen as kind of an idiot. And so he comes into this first meeting of its kind. Uh, they're about to lose $17 billion, right? Uh, so this is not a good situation. And he looks across the table. None of them want to be there, by the way. He looks across the table and all their performance numbers are green. And he looks at them and he says, we're about to lose $17 billion. Is that our plan? Because if it is, we're right on track. And he said something I thought was so important. He said, you can't manage a secret. You know, if we can get the information on the table and talk about it, we have the potential to solve it. If we don't know what's even the problem, how are we going to do that? So about two weeks later, uh, Mark Fields, who was subsequently promoted to CEO after Alan retired, I said, all right, all right, I think I got one of those green things you keep going on about. He said, I'm red on edge. Now, the Edge was a small SUV that Ford was absolutely counting on to establish its sort of legitimacy in the world of full, you know, full lineup of cars. Um, and they've, they've put advertising money aside. They're talking to the dealers. Customers have been revved up. I mean, all this pressure to continue. Now, Mark did the right thing. There was a production problem and he stopped the line. But what do we do with all this fallout? And so he says this in this meeting. The room goes completely quiet. All heads turn to Alan. And what he does in the next three minutes is going to fundamentally shape the rest of his tenure as CEO of that company. So what does he do? Gets up, applauds. Great transparency, Mark. Okay, 
Anybody got any ideas? And as it turned out, when they were called upon to actually contribute what they knew, one person had a terrific idea for what to do with advertising while they were waiting to get Edge out the door. Another person had a thought of how to deal with the leaders, uh, the dealers rather. Uh, another person had actually two engineers who dealt with something almost the same a couple of years before, going to fly them out to Mark's uh, plant and help, help, you know, get on the grounds and help. Within about two minutes, four minutes, they had about 70% of the solution to this problem architected. Now, not perfectly, not to the 99th decimal point, but the outlines were there because they were able to draw into this conversation the contributions and unique backgrounds of the people at that meeting. And so to me, this, this you can't manage a secret, setting the stage, setting positive expectations is a big first step that you can take as a leader in creating the context in which psychological safety can occur. Second thing is I think we need to go to a new mindset, which is to frame the work that you're doing, not as an execution problem. So in execution problem space, it's all about management by objective. Did you meet your targets? And did you get the right thing? And failure is unacceptable. When you're going into high uncertainty, and by the way, you know the pandemic, the economic crisis, the environmental crisis has given you all permission to admit you're in psychologically unusual and very uncertain places. And I think that's, that's a great, actually, relief because you can start with the premise you don't know. <laughs> and starting with the premise you don't know gives you the permission to learn. And so a lot of useful resources on that, certainly Carol Dweck's work on learning mindset, on, on growth mindset rather, uh, I think is a big part of this. And she uses the example, I think, of a wonderful system in a local school in Chicago. And instead of doing pass-fail grading, what they do is they say pass or not yet. Pass or not yet. Now, isn't that brilliant? You're framing the challenge, not as a, oh, you failed, you know, scrap heap of history, whatever that means. But it's, well, you know, you're not quite there yet. Let's work together on how you can accomplish that. So I think if you take that mindset with your teams and your people, it goes a long way to reducing the anxiety, making people say, hey, here are our assumptions. Here's what actually happened. Let's learn from that. And it, it creates just a much different, much better, I think, area. Uh, so framing the work is a learning problem. And I do this a lot in innovation work because in innovation work, we never know. <laughs> you know. I think there's a market for haptic enabled, you know, 3D, whatever comes after Zoom virtual communication. Well, I don't know. Guess what? You don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> what comes after Zoom is a complete blank to many of us. Now we've got opinions and ideas and assumptions, but until those things have a lot of learning invested in them, we're not gonna know what the ultimate solution is. So framing things as learning challenges rather than execution challenges, I think is absolutely uh, key. Then of course we have the quality of leaders. And if you want to create a psychologically safe workspace, you have to show that you are prepared to engage with that. So admitting your own fallibilities, um, admitting where you don't know what's going on. So this is a, a picture of Gary Ridge. He's a, a friend and acquaintance. He's the longtime CEO of WD40. And I mean, you want to talk about a guy that has created a context in which people come to work with a sense of passion and mission, and we're getting the life better. And it's, you know, water dispersant in a metal can. That's what they're actually selling. And yet to them, it's much more than that. It's about making life better. And Gary, I'll talk to you about when he first introduces himself, he says, I'm an unconsciously unaware, mostly incompetent leader who's stumbling to try to find the right answer. And in his books and in his writing, he'll talk about all the times he's done something stupid or hasn't thought something through, or it didn't work out the way he hoped. And it really creates this trust among you know, his, his team and himself. He doesn't talk about failure at all. He talks about learning moments. Uh, he's the co-author of a wonderful book called uh, Don't Grade My Paper, Help Me Get an A. You know, and this whole mindset that he brings, that human beings are, are members of his tribe. He calls them his tribe. And uh, he says, you know, you, it's not a family. You know, it's not like you're unquestionably uh, part of this thing. There's still a expectation for performance and excellence. But at the same time, um, you know, there's this recognition that we're, we're going to pull together your unique gifts and talents. So acknowledging fallibility, being able to say, boy, that was something really stupid that I did, um, is another, I think, key leadership aspect. And then finally, um, model curiosity. Ask lots of questions. And you know, as our political conversation has become so polarized, there's a lot of people from Adam Grant on to others who are saying one way of beginning to break that down is being genuinely curious. 
you know, why do you think that way? Or how does that actually work? I'd, I'd love to know. Not curious in the snarky sense of, well, why do you think that? You know, not, not putting people down, but actually being open to, there is a reason for your belief. Let's understand what that reason is. Ask lots of questions. A couple of tips if you're the most senior person in the room, um, talk last. <laughs> Don't give away your position before people have really had the discussion. Get input from junior people. Um, David Cody, who recently stepped down from a very successful run as CEO of Honeywell, uh, had a policy of any time there was a big meeting you know, to make a big decision, he would always, toward the end of the meeting, call on the youngest person in attendance, the most junior person in attendance, and say, so, you know, Susan, what, what, what do you think of what we've been talking about? And of course, when they first started doing this, Susan was panicked, right? I mean, looking at the boss, looking at the hierarchy, I mean, she's 23 years old, what, how, how does she have a right to weigh in on any of this? And he said, no, really, I want to know, because you may have a different perspective than we do, and it's valuable to us to learn about that. And over time, you know, people learned that they really could raise issues and, and, and you know, concerns and things, and it, it added to a, just a much richer dialogue. Now, you still have decision rights. I mean, you don't absolve your responsibility because you're asking curious questions, but doing that means you're much more likely to get um, valuable input into the room. So I think those principles are very uh, useful. So please be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask. I'm going to summarize with some key points and share with you some ways you can keep in touch. And then we'll have time for a dialogue. So I think a couple of points to remember. I think strategy really does have a new playbook and all that stuff about you know, industry dominance and order of entry. And I mean, it's all useful, but in many cases, it's not really getting us to the right answer. So I think strategy really does have a, a new playbook. I work on that a lot with companies all over the world. Um, we are seeing 10 exchanges, 10 exchanges in so many things, technological possibilities, what we understand to be true about people, social norms, um, you know, all kinds of all kinds of different things. Um, and I think to see what's happening, diversity, inclusion, absolutely essential. Because you, how could one person possibly have the richness of experience of a whole group of people, especially if you've been thoughtful about composing a team where there are a variety of diverse inputs. And I, I think, unfortunately, diversity has come to mean this code word for, oh, we need to bring in, you know, racial diversity or whatever it is. And yes, of course, that's important. I, I would be the last to say that isn't, but that's not all. You know, it, you know if, I'm, if I'm different races, but I have all the same beliefs and I went to all the same schools and I sing all the same songs, you know, that's not going to get you the diversity you're really looking for. So diverse perspectives as well as diverse backgrounds. Um, psychological safety. One of the things Amy told me recently, uh, Amy Edmondson, the inventor of this concept, is she said, oh, I'm sorry I called it psychological safety because that gets people thinking this is about being nice. She said, it's not about being nice. It's about radical candor. It's about you know, insisting that people come forward with the difficult issues, not letting yourself get lulled into kind of CDO, you know, CEO um, uh, tower on a hill where you're isolated from everything. That's what allows you to benefit from diversity. So one of the things I think is sad is I look at so many organizations putting all this effort into genuinely inviting diverse talent in, and then they don't work on the inclusion part. So the inverse talent goes right back out the door. Uh, I think you as the leader set the tone. That's always been true in human existence. I think it's ever more true today. And if you want a psychologically diverse and safe workplace, that has to start with you. And you have to exhibit it in action, in words, in symbolism, in, in small things, in what you pay attention to, and most importantly, in how you react when people do, in fact, bring you bad news or problems for which there's no solution yet. Uh, so you set the tone. Um, and then I think uh, set the stage, you know, emphasize learning and ask a lot of questions. And you'll see, I think, some remarkable uh, potential results. And I think people will really appreciate that. So let's tie this all together. We're in an uncertain environment. The answers are not known. The only way we're gonna find those answers is by safely collecting our wisdom together and, uh, and being willing to share with one another what we perceive and what we hope to uh, achieve. So a little bit about me, this is um, all my 
concept at Columbia. I'm there. Um, <laughs> you can definitely ask questions. I'm on all the different social media things. Um, so Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, you name it. <laughs> YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel now. So feel free to get in touch. Uh, and um, I'm very interested to see what uh, questions you're curious about. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand you back to my hosts. Wow. Thank you, Rita. That was incredibly insightful. Um, I'm just getting texts all over. Um, lots of questions there, many on the chat, but just want to thank you so much for, um, for sharing this with us. And uh, we've got a very active group, so I'm going to dive into the first question. Um, and so Awana says, Rita, what are the top three innovations that come to your mind triggered by COVID-19? And then what effect on the teamwork do they have, if any? Well, there's the obvious ones and the less obvious ones. I think the obvious ones are the acceleration of the digital agenda. The fact that, you know, all this stuff we used to say, oh, we'll get around to that, right? But, you know, you saw things like companies that were suddenly realizing their call center people needed to have laptops at home because up to then they were chained to desktops in a call center. And now we had to go dispersed and revolutionized. So I think it's advanced certainly the digital agenda by an order of magnitude. Um, so I think that's one big one. That's, that's an obvious one. Second one, I think, really has to do with a lot of social engineering and change. And this bleeds over into the second part of the question, which is we're learning you have to be much more mindful when you are remote than you do when you're in person. And I'll draw here on some work that was done by um, David Allen of MIT. And he was interested in researchers and how they share information. And what he looked at was what's the effect of uh, uh, locating them close or far from each other? And what he found when he juxtaposed this closeness measure against information richness, which is how much information is just naturally shared. You don't have to plan it. And he found after you're about 60 feet apart, that information richness just plummets. That, you know, before you're 60 feet apart, everybody knows what's going on. We're all part of the team. It's all great. You know, no gaps. Nobody feels left out. Once you're more than 60 feet apart, it's like, why are we doing that again? What, you know, lots of confusion. So I think one of the big social engineering lessons we've learned from this <laughs> year in pandemic is if you're gonna be more than 60 feet apart, and most of us are right now, you have to be much more intentional about everything about your teams, you know, how you meet, how you structure, how you mimic water cooler conversations, how you build trust, how you, how you share what you know, you know, all these things. So I think there's a whole social engineering dimension uh, that we're learning. And then obviously we're seeing much more interest in things like um, you know, how, do we, how do we use technology to some extent to um, complement or substitute for things that used to happen naturally in person. So things like, you know, how do I get those nonverbal cues and are there ways technology could be helpful in that? So I think a whole series of things like that. I would also say we're not going back. You know, we've spent a painful year learning to do a lot of new stuff. We're not going to just say, oh, well, that was a really fun year. I'm just going to throw all that in the bin. <laughs> so I'll be very interested to see what, what sticks and, and what sort of fades, fades. Right. Like we were talking about before this, uh, before we started, it's amazing. Absolutely. It's like a, a decade's worth of innovation in a year, perhaps. Um, thank you so much, Rita. So we have another question about teamwork from Patricia. Patricia asks, how do you motivate a team to innovate when there are different levels of fears and experiences within that team? Yeah, so that I think takes some work on the team. And what I think people often forget is teams exist and they have two jobs to do, right? One is the ostensible job that team was set up to accomplish, you know, figure out the marketing campaign for this quarter, you know, whatever that is. But the other is the task of looking after the team and how effectively the team works. So one way that I do it for real is I actually have a diagnostic. It's a team effectiveness diagnostic. It covers four uh, qualities among a team of which psychological safety is one. So the others are confidence, commitment, and information flows. And what I find is that something like that, which gives you a diagnostic result, often makes it possible for people to bring up issues that wouldn't come up in the normal course of events. So the way that I do it is um, you've got a survey, everybody fills out the survey anonymously. Uh, so there's no question of, uh, you know, am I gonna get dinged for reporting, whatever. Um, and, and then we have a meeting and you know, depending on the maturity of the team, that can be a facilitated meeting or it could be something we have among ourselves. But the key point is you, you make it safe for everybody to talk about two data points. One is the average sentiment of the team on a set of questions. And the other is the standard deviation. 
uh, and I use a five point scale. So you can have an average of three, but that means totally different things. If half the team is a one and the other half is a five. <laughs> and what I find is just having some kind of structure like that to talk about these things can often unlock lots of productive dialogue. And you'll find people come to discoveries that they never had before. So in one case, I was um, there was a team working on a, a new digital technology product and the key players were the customer service operation and the tech operation. And the tech operation needed a lot of time from the customer service people, specifically the leader of the customer service team, to make sure they were building the right thing. And the customer service team obviously wanted their leader to, to lead, to be there, to be present with him. And this woman who was the leader of the customer service team was just and she hadn't told anybody because she's stoic and, you know, I come to work and I do my job and I get everything done. And she's one of those people that's like perfection and she'll work 20 hours a day. Well, what was end up, ending up happening was she couldn't do either thing well. And it was showing up as rifts in the team. And so we got to this very dramatic moment in this meeting where she said, you know, you guys on the tech team, you just think I'm at your beck and call morning, noon and night. And you folks on the, on the service team think, oh, I'm spending all my time with the glamorous tech people and don't care about you anymore. Neither is true. I'm trying to cover this unbelievable stretch of activity. And what we ended up doing was putting in place some structural shifts. We said, okay, tech people, you, you have been guilty of being a little undisciplined in what you are looking for from the service organization. So we're going to limit you to two days a week of questions. And it's not that we want to limit your ability to engage, but we want to make it manageable, right? So you, you, know, you have to come up with your questions by, I think it was Thursday, Friday. And service team, you have to understand they have a really legitimate need to understand what you're doing here, because if they don't get it right, your jobs are going to be murder for, you know, for a long time. So there's a vested interest. So we built a few more um, linkages. We built a linkage committee. So we supplemented this one woman's activity and, 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 but my point was it wasn't like an interpersonal problem. It was a structural problem in the way the team had designed its work. And that was causing an interpersonal problem. But until you have those kinds of meetings, you don't really, you don't really bring that to the surface. It's really interesting. You're almost a, a mediator in that, but also it's all about the organizational kind of elements. That's, that's mm -hmm. fascinating, um, especially for our audience at Exeter, I think. Um, okay, so well, and I think one of the things for Exeter in particular, hello, Exeter people, is <laughs> as the world has gone digital, the opportunities for malfeasance and wrongdoing have increased exponentially. I mean, and, and this is digital in general, but I think when you're talking about financial digital, um, yeah. you know, when information used to be kept in dusty ledgers in county courthouses, um, you know, you had to go to a lot of effort to get it, right? Today, information just looks everywhere and it's effortless, you know, and, uh, and I think that introduces like, all kinds of unexpected consequences we haven't quite grappled with yet. Right, that's true, very true, it's almost too true. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so the next we have from a third live question, um, Celia says, have you researched any nuances of psychological safety in organizations? For example, people are comfortable contributing on one topic area, but not in another. And then if so, how do you help leaders recognize those gaps in safety? Yeah, and um, so not everybody's gonna contribute equally on everything. And, and I think that's just a fact of human life. Not everybody feels comfortable. You know, I have um, people on my team who like the minute you mention technology, they just go <laughs> don't, don't raise that to me. And then I have others, like I, I, had, I had a problem with my production system and there's one of the guys on my team who's tech and the guy on the service provider who's tech and they're having email exchanges and I'm reading them and I know what the words are, but I have absolutely <laughs> no idea what they're talking about. Um, so I think another tool that I use a lot with teams is um, to understand that teams, the people in teams have different preferences for learning um, and this is a model that was put together by Honey and Mumford years ago, but I find it just useful because it's simple, right? So if you think about a learning cycle, we can have an experience and then we draw some conclusions from that experience. Then we plan the next step. Uh, sorry, then we, we you know, conclude why it happened and then we plan the next step. And so each of those stages of learning tends to be uh, correlated with how we prefer to learn. We human beings. So people we call activists, they love to have experiences, right? So don't, don't let's sit in the meeting, let's take a walk, right? You know, um, tell me your great idea. And the way you have to pitch an activist is you have to go into their office and say, you know, um, VJ, I have this idea for something that could solve this incredibly thorny problem. Do you have a minute like, in person? Let's go for a walk in Zoom. Like, like when, when can I talk to you about this? I'm so excited and enthusiasm and excitement and moment, forward momentum. You go to VJ and you say, well, you know, I've been giving 
a lot of thought to this complex problem of how we're going to, I mean, gone, right? This person is already like, like they're, they're on their <laughs> phone, right? You know, <laughs> So that's activists. Then we have reflectors. Now reflectors are fascinating because they like to take in information. They like to think about it. They like to mull it over. They're the kind of people who will say, well, on the one hand, but on the other hand, and they think about things very deeply. What's interesting about them is very often, and this is a good thing for leaders to remember, very often they're quiet. They will resolve issues to their own satisfaction and feel perfectly comfortable telling no one. <laughs> I have a, a client once who's a massive reflector, CEO type guy, and he had the, he happened to wear these big round glasses. He looked kind of like the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and uh, one of his strategy people designed this session in a, in a big strategy retreat they had, which I advised her against. I was like, don't do that. But the idea was we were going to have rapid fire questions and he was going to respond and this was going to be energizing. And so he gets the first question and he sort of disappears behind his glasses. And like a painful minute or two. Now, you know how long a minute is in one of these. <laughs> and then he kind of comes back with an incredibly thoughtful, nuanced answer. That's reflectors. And as a leader, and this gets to your question of, of when do you need to draw them out? You may need to actually make a little more effort yes. drawing people like that out. Then we have theorists. Theorists are the kind of people when you say, oh, could you explain to me how that works? They're like, oh, absolutely. And if you're in a room with them, they're on the whiteboard. If you're in a Zoom or something with them, they're hauling out their digital scratch pads and circles and lines and how everything connects. Very analytical, right? Explain to me how this all... And you left out the entire, you know, Eurasia dimension. How could you do that? So theorists want completeness and connections. And everything's got to tie together. And then we have pragmatists who are the people who are all about planning the next step, right? Just show me what the, what's the bottom line here. What's the end result? Now, the reason I raise these is that what we read as people being shy or not willing to come forward in a meeting is often a function of their preferred learning style. Now, by the way, I should say we all share in each of those. It's not like we're doomed to be activists forever. You can mm -hmm. reflect if you have to. It's just not where you like to go. <laughs> and so part of the construct of a team, I think, is to try, try to understand a diversity of learning styles, but also recognize the style that one person is comfortable with will drive another person absolutely nuts. So try this as an experiment. So get your R&D guys together with your salespeople and just let them go into a conversation unfacilitated and watch what happens. It's a disaster because salespeople are activists by, by and large, right? They're, let's go. Let's hit new and improve. And R&D guys are analysts. You know, let's think about this. Let's think about the theory behind this. How do I? And so you have to bridge that a bit, I think, and try to bring out the best in them. And I think, by the way, having that conversation about who's who in a team can often be super, yeah. super fun and super engaging. Absolutely. That it, resonates is there almost an too well. Teams? Like, would you say, there's, is there an optimal balance of those teams? Like, is there, is the best formula, like, it is, does it matter, you know, one activist, one, you know, or do you want to have, um, is it, have a mix? Yeah, I think it probably depends on the team's task, right? So if I'm designing a nuclear facility, I don't want a lot of activists on that team. <laughs> Um, you know, maybe one or two, just so we don't all fall asleep at our desks. But <laughs> you know, if the work is thoughtful, painstaking, connect the dots, connect the dots, connect the dots. You probably want somebody who really likes that. Um, if if you've got a um, a challenge, it's really about building people and excitement and enthusiasm and creating momentum. You probably want more activists. So I think it's far partly a function of the task they have to do. You'll tend to find different functions in an organization weight differently on those on those preferences. Yeah, that makes sense and, and really resonates. And I certainly know how, where Cody falls <laughs> on that spectrum. Um, so can't wait to talk to her about that after. Um, so Rita, we have another question that I think really segues into, into this discussion, which is, well, how do you find these traits? And I think, you know, the traits of psychological safety and, and everything you were discussing in smaller organizations where there might be less clarity on what leadership is or who leadership is. Um, well, a couple of ways to, to think about that. One is um, periodically get your heads out of out of what you're doing and talk about how you're doing it. You know, I think just having that conversation, making it clear that you're interested, um, I think is is valuable. I think the principles we talked about earlier, you know, set the table, set the context, ask a lot of questions, you know, make sure that people feel that they can be um, heard in the, make sure it feels like learning. Um, but I think with smaller organizations, especially, because usually there's just not enough time to go around to do everything you want to do. 
and so we tend to run around in hamster cages, you know, like, let's get this done by this week. Mm. And we don't really make the time to pause and say, well, how are we doing? Um, and there's lots of different devices you can use. I mean, there's surveys, there's diagnostics, there's questionnaires, there's facilitation. I mean, there's, there's a lot of tools at your disposal, but I think before you can even get to the tools, you have to say, okay, once every, let's say once every two weeks, right? We're going to have a meeting like a water cooler meeting and we're, you know, maybe everybody gets donuts or something and we're going to talk about, you know, how are we doing as a team? How are we doing on a couple of key things, supporting each other, making sure people feel welcome to present. Let's maybe have five minutes set aside. We're talking about something that we tried that didn't work in a constructive way. So the way that I would do that is say something like, okay, I'll make this up completely, but let's say it's December of 2019, and I have come up with the most ingenious um, millennium-oriented travel experience mm -hmm. ever experienced in the entire world, right? And, and we all agree, right? All the assumptions are right. We've done our research. We've got our target market. We've got validation from the market. This is all fantastic. And we're about to go launch the thing in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not bad management. That's not bad thinking. That's really horrifically bad luck. And so I think the more that you can make that distinction between bad luck and bad management, the more you can make your assumptions clear. Um, one resource I can offer that I think is wonderful is uh, Patty McCord's book, Powerful. And Patty was the original HR director at Netflix. And what she talks about in the book is if you as a leader can create clarity around objectives, the strategy, what our assumptions are, if you can put in shape that strategic context you need to do a lot less of control. And I think that's a valuable thing to remember because some small organizations, you know, you, I know I've seen this, you know, people feel like, oh my God, if I don't do it all, it's not going to get done right. <laughs> and the reality is in a small organization, if you don't train other people how to do it, you're going to be stuck doing that forever. <laughs> right? Absolutely. It's the, uh, the future me problem versus the current me problem. <laughs> <laughs> Future me is not super ha super happy. Um, okay, so we have another question from uh, from Sarah, and the question is: What do you do when the environment is not psychologically safe, and leadership is not working on changing that? Oh, okay. that's a tough tough situation. Um, well, I think I think it's think of it like ripples in a in a body of water. You have to start somewhere. So pick a couple of uh, people, and they may not be people directly in the organization, they may be outsiders, they may be people who can be a part of your own, if you want to call it, personal board of directors. Um, start there and create that for yourself. Then, like, what's the next ripple? That could be people who are amenable, you know, they're not opposed, <laughs> but they're also not, you know, on board yet. And how do we like bring them along and get them to see the results? And I think early wins are important there. So, hey, we never would have accomplished this if so-and-so hadn't brought this idea into the discourse, or if we hadn't taken the afternoon to go talk to somebody. And then I think it starts as a, a, a ripple kind of a thing. Um, I do a whole session on organizational politics. And one of the things that we find with politics is um, you need people to be unhappy with the way things are going. So think about how you can make the people who are currently resisting kind of go, you know, this isn't great. This isn't a great place to be. We need a vision for how things could be. So if this was working, this is what it would look like. Doesn't it strike you as a lot better than where we are now? And you need um, practices that remove obstacles to creating that change. And this is a concept that was come up with by Michael Beer years and years ago, but it, I like it because it's simple. And then you need that pressure to overcome the forces of resistance. So the first thing I would probably be inclined to do is dig down into why, you know, because when you think about somebody who's being obstinate or resistant or, you know, unhelpful, there's a reason why. So let's take a, a, a behavioral example. Let's take smoking, right? And we know it's really, really hard to give up smoking. And some of that is the addiction. But another piece of it is there's a loss when you give up smoking. You know, back in the day when we were in offices, well, going out for your smoking break was a social time. You know, it was a time to connect with others. Uh, smoking helped reduce anxiety. Smoking helped give you something to do with fidgety fingers. Smoking helped you to meet people that you wouldn't have ordinarily met. So I think understanding the why, and, and even though we could all objectively admit, you know, smoking is not good for you, until you've tackled the, reason, the other reasons why people would be smoking, until you've got some substitute for those, it's very difficult to change that behavior because they're getting something out of it. And let's understand what they're getting out of it. Uh, and that'll give you the levers for changing it, potentially. Really interesting. Um, 
I just have to plug an amazing friends episode that speaks exactly <laughs> to the, to what you give up when you stop smoking, um, you know, millennial generation. So we have another conver- uh, question from Barbara who asked whether do companies need to be focused on all four inflection points or can they stay relevant by focusing on only a few? Oh, and that gets to scope. Um, I mean, you can't boil the ocean. If I could tell you, you know, oh yes, I can solve climate change and you know, all these other, that would be nuts. No, I think you have to pick your arena of activity. Um, and I think you need to be aware that these things are all happening and what might they change in your business. So I'll make this up. If you're a friend of mine runs a company that's in the, 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 the wood business, you know, they make two by fours and stuff like that. And the environment is going to have a lot more impact on him than it would somebody who's say doing digital compliance or whatever. So I think they'll have differential impacts on your business. I just think it's smart to be aware of how they intersect as well. Mm. Um, Because if you think about it, things like climate change uh, are making questions like immigration harder to deal with. And they're making questions of um, resources and supply chains more tricky. So really trying to think through how these things impact and and reverberate upon each other is useful, I think, to me. So I I know we have a lot of questions, but I think we're we're nearing our time. Do you want to do one more or should we? I'll try this succinct. I know. I, I, so Laura, do you want to take the last one and then I'll um, just give everybody the final. Sure. Part. So I think our last question is from Henry Rita, who asks a really important, great closing question, which is what role does courage have in finding the inflection point? Oh, huge, huge. Because you've got to admit that the past is not the map for the future. And that is very scary to a lot of people. So I think courage is enormously important. The good news is you can de-risk these things and you can do things that are courageous without requiring huge sacrifice. Mm. Great. Well, there's definitely more questions and I think Rita has been generous enough to review those questions and maybe answer a few um, in writing. So we'll look out for that. But I just wanted to, you know, on behalf of Exeger, on behalf of Laura and myself, thank you so much, Rita, for this incredible discussion. And to everybody who tuned in today, I saw over 200 people had joined and that's really great. So lots of interest on this topic for sure. Um, So if you want to check out, um, you know, more about Rita, you can visit her website at ritamcgrath.com. And she'll also be teaching in two upcoming executive education programs this spring. Um, So one is strategy in uncertain times, and that's from April 19th through 23rd coming right up. And then women in leadership on May 4th through 26th. Um, And we'll be sending more information about both of those after this event. Uh, For more information on Exeger and future Exeger wins events, please follow Exeger on LinkedIn. And to stay in touch about upcoming professional development programs, you can also follow the Columbia Business School Executive Education page. But um, again, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Fun. Thanks. Thank you again, Rita. This is great. To be continued. Yes. To be um, continued. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Columbia.